Good morning, uh, good afternoon, and good evening to everyone from Manila, the Philippines, and uh, welcome to the latest Asia Impact webinar from the Asian Development Bank. My name is Joseph Maria Singham, a statistician at the Asian Development Bank. I will be the host as well as the moderator for today's webinar. Uh, today, uh, we will be discussing an exciting and a very relevant topic, uh, that is the digital economy. Over the years, uh, digital technologies have developed at a very incessant pace, resulting in components that are far smaller, more efficient and cheaper to manufacture and operate than their analog counterparts. Digital technologies uh, now play a very prominent role in modern life. Uh, in response to this, uh, development, academic and even private institutions have started to develop methodologies to measure digitalization in the context of economic statistics. A variety of uh, measurement methods have been brought forward uh, within and uh, outside the context of GDP. Our team at the Asian Development Bank has formulated uh, one such framework uh, for measuring uh, the digital economy, uh, which uh, will be released on August 23rd as a special supplement uh, report to the key indicators for Asia and the Pacific uh, 2021 edition. This seminar uh, will help us gather insights and comments from our uh, experts, as well as the audience, uh, that will help us to uh, improve the relevance, uh, quality, uh, and the timeliness of our report. Uh, so with that introduction, uh, we would like to introduce our uh, presenter, uh, the report will be, uh, the results will be presented by uh, Ms. Clara de los Santos, who led the digital economy measurement project at uh, the Asian Development Bank. And he's, she's also the lead author for the report. We will, we are also uh, joined by uh, an esteemed panel of experts. Uh, first, uh, uh, Nadeem Ahmed, who is the uh, deputy director of the Center for Entrepreneurship SMEs, regions, and cities uh, at the OECD. Uh, Nadeem and I have been uh, working together on a number of projects for a very long time. Uh, we are also happy to welcome uh, Sanjeev Mahajan. He is the head of methods and research engagement uh, at the Office for National Statistics uh, of the, the United Kingdom, an expert in system of national accounts and input-output economics analysis. And uh, we are also joined by our uh, chief economist, uh, Dr. Sawada. Uh, he will provide us the broader perspective on the uh, digital economy. Uh, unfortunately, the last panelist, uh, Ms. Metal Day Park, uh, could not join us due to unforeseen circumstances. Uh, however, uh, we should be able to cover all aspects uh, that we uh, hope to uh, cover today. Thank you. And um, after the presentation, uh, we will be opening uh, for questions. Uh, please type your questions into the uh, Q&A box, uh, which you will find at the bottom of your screen. Uh, you can also give a like or uh, click the thumbs up uh, for existing questions as we will address the most popular questions first. Uh, so at this point, I will um, ask uh, Ms. Clara de los Santos to start the presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Joseph. Hello, everyone. Uh, it is my pleasure to present our team's work in this webinar. As Joseph mentioned, it's a very timely topic in today's world, and our team is really proud to contribute to the discourse. So let me begin with explaining our proposed framework for the digital economy, or what we term as the core of the digital economy. To give some background, there currently exists a variety of proposed definitions and measurement frameworks for the digital economy. As a result, organizations and economies use different measures, which are challenging to compare. We propose a simple and practical framework. We provide a concrete definition for the digital economy, specifically digital products and industries, based on concepts generally agreed upon by experts in the field. We then measure the contributions to and from this established set of digital industries, 
and can come up with a share of GDP attributable to the digital economy using Leontief coefficients and input-output analysis. And we make use of readily available national accounts with relatively simple data adjustment needs. We then apply the framework on real-world data and conduct various analyses. As a starting point, we define the digital economy as the contribution to the GDP of any exchange or flow of economic value involving digital products and or industries. And we define digital products as goods and services with a main function of generating, processing, and or storing digitized data. Digital industries are simply the primary producers of, of these products. Based on these, on these criteria, we have identified hardware, software, web publishing, telecommunications, and specialized and support services as our core digital products. Goods and services comprising or supporting digital products, such as semiconductors, are considered digitally enabling. Goods and services that use digital products, such as car manufacturing, are considered digitally enabled. Digitally enabling and digitally enabled products, while not considered the main digital products, are captured in our framework via their contributions to and from the digital products. The data used in this framework are directly trans uh, extracted from an input-output table. However, supply and use tables may be transformed and also give more rudimentary detail on non-digital capital purchases, among others. For national estimates, this obviously requires domestic tables. For comparability, the same sectors should be identified across different classification systems. The same presentation format should be used and the same price and valuation used across different economies. This aggregation is essential when digital sectors are aggregated with non-digital sectors. For example, software publishing is often lumped together with book publishing. Different data sources may be used for this aggregation. For regional or global estimates, regional or inter-country IOTs are more suitable. For such uses, we disaggregated these three sectors in our multi-regional input-output tables to isolate the digital sectors, expanding it from 35 sectors to 38. Using matrices from the IOT, we can then capture the digital economy by measuring the value-added contribution of an industry to the final goods production of another industry within an economy. This can be traced from the VBY, VBY matrix, which is the multiplication of the direct value added coefficient vector V, the total output requirements from each industry in order to meet final demand, or Leontief inverse matrix B, and the final demand vector Y. Our digital GDP equation is shown here, which takes specific components from the VBY matrix. To illustrate, assuming that industry one is the aggregate digital sector, Term one represents the first column of the VBY matrix or the backward linkages, which refer to the interconnection of the digital sector with those sectors from which it purchases inputs and can be interpreted as the digitally enabling industries defined earlier. Term two represents the first row or the forward linkages, which refer to the interconnection of the digital sector with those sectors to which it sells its output and can be interpreted as the digitally enabled industries also defined earlier. The intersection of these two terms here needs to be removed in order to avoid double counting, which is represented by the third term. We also capture the non-digital capital required by the digital sector, because the capital goods produced by a non-digital industry and purchased by the digital industry also derive value from other industries in the economy. To do so, we post-multiply shares of GFCF out of total final demand per sector, vector R to the VBY matrix. The entries concerned are represented by term four. We then apply the framework to 16 economies spanning several regions in Asia and the Pacific, North America and Europe. We used current price tables mainly from national statistics offices attempting at least two periods for most economies spanning years 2000 to 2019 as seen here. Digital economy estimates range from approximately two to 9%. To take a closer look, we divided the economy years into two groups, period one and period two. In period one, using the level terms, USA in 2010 leads by significant margin, followed by Japan in 2011 and People's Republic of China in 2012. In terms of share of GDP, the US in 2010 also had the largest share, followed by Malaysia in 2010 and Thailand in 2010. In period two, US 2019 was still the largest digital economy in absolute terms, followed by Japan in 2015 and India in 2014. In percentage GDP terms, 
digital, G uh, digital economy shares were still the highest in the US, followed by Taipei, China and in 2016 and Malaysia in 2015. We looked at the compound annual growth rates between two periods per economy, both in level terms and as a percentage of GDP. In level terms, all economies except Thailand exhibited a positive growth rate, with several economies' digital GDP growing more ex exceptionally than others. Most economies' digital GDP as a percentage of economy-wide GDP were on the negative side, however. The largest downtrend is seen in Fiji, which is mainly due to capital investment made by the digital sector in 2011, which was significantly lower in 2015. In Thailand, the significant negative growth is mainly due a negative growth rate is mainly due to its backward linkages. By term in our equation, a major fraction of the digital GDP by countries like Fiji, Australia, and Denmark can be attributed to their forward linkages represented by the green bars here. They act as suppliers of value added to domestic non-digital sectors, whereas countries like Taipei, China, Thailand, and People's Republic of China had a greater fraction of their digital GDP contributed by backward linkages represented by the dark blue bars here, acting more so as users of non-digital sectors in the production chain. By digital sector, concentration is quite varied. Hardware comprises a huge chunk for Taipei, China, uh, Singapore, and Thailand while telecommunications accounts for the overwhelming majority for Fiji, Indonesia, and Kazakhstan. We also wanted to explore the roles that digital industries play in economic production, particularly the extent of digital products value added contribution to various production processes of non-digital industries. We analyze the digitally dependent sectors in three ways. First, using the forward linkages in our equation, representing the contributions of the digital sector to the digitally enabled industries, we found that collectively highest were wholesale and retail trade, public administration and defense, electronic, electrical, and optical equipment, financial intermediation, and construction. Narrowing down our selected economies, this chart shows that Australia's finance, public administration, and trade sectors are most digitalized, whereas Thailand and, P and the People Republic of China's electronics and electrical sectors are the most digitalized. Second, we applied the VBY framework to 10 sectors identified as most digitally disrupted by the OECD shown here, which combined with our digital sectors allowed us to compete for each selected economy's digitally dependent economy. As you can see here, it, it amounts to as quite a sizable share per economy, ranging from 17 to 35% of GDP in both periods examined. The largest digitally dependent economies are those of Fiji, Australia, and Thailand. Fiji's was particularly high due to, due to the significantly larger size of its accommodation services linked to its large tourism sectors. Also, using our forward linkages, we computed for the depth of digitalization of these 10 sectors, the highest of which were Singapore and Fiji's travel agency, tour operator, and other reservation services, followed by Malaysia and Denmark's gambling and betting services. Third, we looked at the ratio of intermediate inputs of digital products to total inputs to measure the extent of digital technology used in the economy. The direction of trends is similar to the economic size of digitally dependent sectors in the previous analysis. By sector, direct digital dependence across economies increased overall from period one to period two. However, this is not uniform across all sectors. Significant growth in digital inputs is, is observed in publishing as well as in education while finance and advertising sectors slightly eased in period two. In general, across all analyses, we found that more service-oriented economies tend to have deeper forward linkages with a core digital economy, and that digitalization in services is increasing. A relevant topic on digital dependence is the rise of free digital content, such as that provided by Facebook, TikTok, YouTube, among many others. What kept these firms rising to the top ranks is the value of data that they hold in order to create more targeted advertising. Measuring these will be valuable in providing a more complete picture of value creation by digital firms. We estimated the magnitude of, of data assets in the developing economy of India by replicating the experimental sum of cost approaches made in Australia, Canada, and the USA. 
our estimates show three key observations. First, the bulk of data assets in India are related to recording and processing, or here data, unlike in more advanced economies where higher value is observed in databases and data science components. Second, data assets are also not yet growing at a faster rate than the economy-wide investments in stocks, but are increasing in tandem with other types of assets. And third, data investments are not as large as it is in the advanced economy examples. For India, it's only at about 3.4% of total GFCF, whereas in Canada, it's 8% it's of its GFCF. It's important to highlight that this is still ongoing work, and um, this, is, this has not yet been finalized by the statistical community. We conducted several other analyses as well. We looked at digital output multipliers, which gives the impact of a unit change in the final demand for digital sectors output on the gross output of an economy. Comparing MRIO-based multipliers of digital and non-digital sectors, which shows impact relative to the global economy, we observed large positive digital and non-digital gaps in the Republic of Korea, the People's Republic of China, Taipei, China, Malaysia, and Singapore which provide an indication that digital sectors in these economies are more interlinked to other economy sectors than non-digital sectors. We also compared MRIO-based and national IoT-based multipliers. The latter shows impact relative to the domestic economy instead. Using the NIOTs, People's Republic of China had the highest output multipliers for hardware and information services. Using MRIO-based multipliers, uh, People's Republic of China also led the hardware industry, although uh, hardware multipliers, although Singapore led telecommunications and information services with significant margins from its NIOT-based multipliers. What this says is that MRIO-based multipliers are generally higher than NIOT-based ones because they nuance the sources of imports and destination of exports thus allowing the calculation for interregional spillovers. Earlier, we saw that the annual growth rate of the digital economy was negative for most economies. However, using constant price data on a few economies results in positive growth rates. As most first period estimates were higher by volume. The digital sector of Japan notably seemed to have higher contributions in value terms, while that of Canada appeared to have been smaller. This points to declining prices coupled with increasing productivity of core digital products. Key industries in the top 10 were generally retained. However, changes in order are observed for some. We also employ a structural decomposition analysis by Reinders and De Vries to determine what drives changes in labor demand in the digital economy. And we classify employment in the digital economy as employment in digital sectors, as well as in digitally enabled sectors using the OECD's digitally disrupted sectors shown earlier. Shown here are the results for India. It can be observed that over time, improvements in sector technology, represented by the green bars, reduces overall labor demand in telecommunications. However, this is partially offset by increased consumption of digital products, increased overall consumption, and changes in production recipe. This is also the overall observation with other economies studied. Global value chain indicators were computed using the 2000 to 2014 YO tables and the 2017 to 2019 ADB MRIO tables. Through years 2009 to 2019, which was after the global financial crisis, total GVC participation of digital sectors grew faster than non-digital sectors. However, by 2019, amid the US-China trade conflict, GVC participation of digital sectors declined more significantly than non-digital sectors indicating that this trade conflict disproportionately threatens the forward and backward linkages of digital sectors. The forward GVC participation of computer manufacturing receded between 2014 and 2019. Meanwhile, the forward GVC participation of information services grew intensely. This, indicate, this indicates more rapid trading and services compared to goods within the digital economy over this time period. The slowing of goods trading replaced by rapid exchange and digital services and cross-border data flows is considered the new phase of globalization. While localization initiatives are underway for digital goods production due to the US-China tech cold war, thus causing its GVC participation rates to recede, trading in digital services is not as threatened by onshoring sentiments. Also, using the ADB MRIO, we estimated the overall changes in the digital economy from 2019 to 2020. 
which resulted in a decline in the digital economy as a share of GDP across economies, except for Denmark, Taipei, China, People's Republic of China, and Malaysia. These increases were fueled mainly by hardware, as shown by the green bars. We also isolated the changes related to e-commerce activity, which showed increases in the demand for digital orders, represented by the green and yellow bars in this chart. This suggests that the pandemic has actually sped up the pace on e-commerce adoption in 2020. Furthermore, based on data from various organizations, Industry 4.0 is expected to grow in the next decade, especially for artificial intelligence and IoT technologies, with higher growth rate estimations and forecasts post-2019 than in previous years. Data limitations in national accounts pose challenges for the exact measurement of Industry 4.0 technologies. However, these are either considered digital products or require an overlap of nearly all the identified digital products in the framework and are therefore captured in the resulting digital economy estimates. Let me conclude with a few main points from this discussion. Our proposed framework provides a clear definition of the digital economy and measures the share of GDP attributable to it, that is, contributions to and from an established set of digital products in terms of value added. We were able to apply the framework on multiple economies using relatively simple data requirements, given that timely and detailed IoTs or SUTs are available. Application to real-world data provides insightful results. The total digital economy constitutes a significant portion, 2-9% to of every selected economy's GDP. With the estimated overall digitally dependent economies ranging from 17-35% to of GDP. Meanwhile, impacts of the digital sectors on output among economies are generally higher relative to the global economy than to the domestic economy. Growth in the digital economy appears to slow down for most economies when observing current prices. However, analysis using certain economies' constant price tables suggests positive growth in volume terms. While effects of technology improvements observably reduce labor demand, positive impacts on consumption and new labor requirements may compensate. GVC participation of digital sectors had been growing in the past decade, driven by rapid trading in services. However, the US-China trade conflict and COVID-19 have possibly disrupted digital progress in most recent years. Despite this, the e-commerce industry is evidently growing, while Industry 4.0 technologies are projected to grow at a faster pace over the next 10 years. Moving forward, as we continue to conduct and update our analyses, we hope to produce more evidence and insight to contribute to a universal standard system for measuring the digital economy. Flashing here our core digital economy team and the authors for the upcoming report. Thank you very much. Back to you, Joseph. Well, thanks a lot, Clara, and thank you very much for this presentation, which has been quite informative, insightful, as well as interesting. Uh, so we can now move on to the panel discussion. Uh, I will start with a few uh, questions for our panelists, and then we will follow with questions from our audience. Uh, so let me start ask Nadim the very first question. Um, we would like to get your, uh, you know, given your vast experience and expertise in this field, we would like to get your comments and insights on the framework we presented and also any uh, thoughts, ideas, suggestions on how to improve or enhance it. Over to you, Nadeem. Uh, thanks, Joseph, and, and thanks, Clara, for, for an excellent presentation. I mean, you've mentioned, of course, that, um, that I have some experience in the field, and I think that experience is um, reflected very well in, in your report um, in the sense that we have, I think, gone through the same type of intellectual difficulties or intellectual struggles in thinking through um, what the digital economy is. Now, I mean, perhaps I'll just say a few words in terms of what we've been doing at the OECD and, of course, convening um, other international organisations and assist the international community in general um, together to try to, to bring together a consensus and a view. And I think it's probably fair to say that that right now there is a consensus and there is a view. So perhaps that's perhaps one of the first things that you could change um, in, in, the, in, the, in the framework. But I think I've also, you know, throughout this, this journey, always welcomed any contributions to the discussion because all contributions, I think, add value um, to the work that we're all collectively trying to do together and trying to, to basically unpack this black box. I mean, when we started our journey, um, it was really driven around the idea that there was an awful lot of confusion around what was and what wasn't in. GDP and whether or not they were basically big measurement issues, whether or something was missing. And I think we you know we, we agree that there are perhaps aspects of the digital economy, the broad in a broader sense, as we understand it, that perhaps missing 
um, but not necessarily in the sense that they're missing from GDP, but they're missing from the economic statistics framework. And data, you mentioned, Clara, I guess, is the big elephant in the room here when we think about what's currently missing from our understanding of the digital economy and macroeconomic statistics. Now, we know that data, and many people refer to it as the oil of the digital economy, um, is not well measured, you know, because most of these transactions are invisible and they're non-market. And so at the OECD, our approach has been to try to bring together a unifying framework. And the unifying framework doesn't say this is the digital economy. It's a unifying framework that tries to unpack um, basically a whole range of different areas that people consider to be the digital economy. And so when we, we looked at it from the view of the output dimension and also the demand dimension. And when we think about the digital economy as a consumer, from a demand perspective, you know, generally, um, we, we arrive at a notion of, say, e-commerce, you know, basically the, those types of digitally enabled transactions, as you would see them. Um, but, you know, but the e-commerce so is, is one of the ways that people think about the size of the digital economy. So you've seen many estimates that refer only to e-commerce transactions. Now, we, know, we knew this was a relatively limited view of the digital economy because it doesn't show, for example, how that process of production is engaged. And so we also want to take an output view. <clears throat> so at the OECD, and this is now, like I said, I think the consensus in the international citizens community, it's about making sure that we have a framework that allows all these different facets of the digital economy to be visualized in the economic accounting system. And those facets allow us to basically provide a view of a range of industries that are contributing in one form or another or benefiting in one form or another um, from the, the digital economy and others on the, on, the, on the product side, those aspects of consumption that are also being driven by the digital economies. It allows us to have a view, for example, of e-commerce transactions. So I guess in, you know, perhaps my, my starting point in terms of comments on the framework that you put together at the moment is that I'd probably, be, um, I'd probably try to narrow down the way that I refer to it. And you know, the, the, narrow, the narrow view I'd be perhaps more inclined to refer to it as the, the digital industries or something like that, rather than digital economy. Because I mean, in fairness, there are large parts of the digital economy that are not captured in this framework, but they're still extraordinarily relevant to people who do want to understand the digital economy. And those, for example, who want to understand e-commerce, for example, won't be able to find it in this framework. So I think that's perhaps um, you know, the, my, my first main observation in terms of the framework. Like I said, it's a great framework. Um, and you've done you know, a great job in bringing this information all together. And it provides a lot of value to the discourse that we're having. But I think they just try to limit you know, what you're trying to, to capture here and what exactly you're capturing. I mean, perhaps I'll just say a few words in terms of you know, what we've tried to do at the OECD as, as to create this coherent unifying framework. And what we've tried to do within the supply use framework is identify a set of, of seven, I think it's seven, seven industries. Um, that we think are important. And they're grouped around what we refer to as digitally enabling industries. And I think that they are very similar to your set of digital industries. We're talking there fundamentally about the ICT sector, recognizing they play an important role in the digital transformation. We then let's talk about the data and advertising driven digital platforms, because we know that they are a huge and important component of the digital economy. Other producers operating only digitally, and then we have digital intermediation platforms that charge a fee, firms dependent on digital intermediation platforms. And that allows us to capture all of these, I mean, the, the platform, the, the, gig, the gig type economy workers, which is an important dimension of the digital economy. For example, your Ubers and so on. You want to understand how those, the, the self-employed, for example, are engaging with those platforms to basically create and drive this gig economy. So it's another aspect of the, of the the digital economy that we think is really important. Um, E-tailers, of course, you know, the, the just the pure e-commerce providers are also important. And then we have also the financial digital services sector. What we try to do with our industry perspective is provide that view of each of these dimensions so users can see straight away, okay, this is the contribution of this sector, that sector, and they can unpack it or repack it in ways that are relevant to their own focus of analysis. And so that's our, you know, the, what we've tried to do is, is provide a system and a framework at the international level that works for all. Now, on the product side, of course, what we've also tried to do is capture all the dimensions there too, recognizing that there's a distinction between, for example, you know, e-commerce, and then of course, digitally delivered services and those services that go through platforms, all of them are important components. So perhaps that's perhaps just the, the starting point in terms of the, 
the overall discussion. You know, limit perhaps the way that you refer to it. Recognize that it's an important component of the of the overall process. What I, where I think, you know, your work adds, you know, huge value is it provides insights in terms of the role of the digital industries in basically driving other aspects of the broader digital economy. Not all of it, but other aspects of it. It shows, for example, that forward and backward linkages of the economy, which we think are really important, um, but also how they engage in global value chains. It doesn't capture, like I said, the whole gamut. And the whole gamut, I think, is what we're trying to provide um, within, within our framework. I mean, just perhaps drilling down in terms of specific components, I mean, if, you know, bearing in mind that chapeau of just perhaps redefining the way that you're referring to it. Um, I would also perhaps think again about you know, the way that you try to embody this capital in the system. I mean, my understanding of what you've done at the moment in terms of the embodiment of capital is that you're looking at just gross fixed capital formation and not capital stock. And I think it's important that what you, what you try to do is reflect the capital stock and the capital services that are driven by that capital stock in the embodiment and the use, not the gross fixed capital formation, I think that's unfortunately going to give you odd results because, of course, okay. particularly because GFCF is quite lumpy in the way that it's all put together. And you, and you want to understand how that flows through the system. Um, I mean, perhaps I think, just in uh, terms of... Um, maybe we'll get to that uh, the next okay, point well, later. I, I'll leave it there. Those are the key points that I wanted to make. All right. Thanks a lot, Nadeem. Um, let me ask the next question to Sanjeev. Um, how does uh, this framework uh, compares with other measures of digital economy? And also, if you could talk about uh, what are the uses of indicators related to digital economy uh, in economic and policy analysis? Uh, thank you, Joseph, and good morning, everybody. Um, there's a lot of stuff that Nadim's covered, uh, definitely support, and there's lots of hooks and caveats there. Um, first, first quick thing I would say is, um, the element of digital and terminology is very important and it's changing because it's evolving. There lies separate challenges. Um, so, for example, if I take um, our, your first industry in the classification, the agriculture, your, your farmer uses software to record the accounts. But actually, the farmer also has now robots and artificial intelligence to do the harvesting. Is the agriculture industry digital? Hmm, interesting. So there's lots of change going on. Um, and is digital like electricity that everyone's going to use it? And this change makes definitions much harder to make sure they're future proofed. But we've got to grapple with the issue. And I think Nadim's colleagues in OECD and Nadim himself have led a lot of work on the digital supply news tables in order to try to tackle the definitions. And I think um, the work that you've done in terms of producers, enablers and users I think is really important because that links to indicators for different parts of that chain and it has different jobs it has different productivity etc the enablers picture will be very different from the producers and the users but having the delineation is very important it adds a lot of useful information and links to policy as well I think the forward linkage stuff is very important but all of this, in terms of we base it on input output tables and supply news tables, gives us what I call stru the structural information. You've got a number of issues here. Some countries don't produce supply news tables or input output tables. How are we going to get bring them to the fold? And how are we going to ensure that they are all consistent using the same definitions? Um, the definitions, I think, are evolving. The new products and new industries are almost like evolving. So in terms of like uh, indicators, I think the supply news tables could be used a bit more because I think they're more likely to be produced a little bit more timely than input output tables and their frequency. And then I think we need to also think about more timely indicators. So most countries don't have what I would call timely supply news tables in terms of we're now in 2021. Um, my, the nearest time uh, annual period you'd have for a supply news table on a an input output table will be 2020 or 2019 or much earlier. So I think complementing the structural information from the IO framework, I think some timely indicators would also be sought to be developed. And you could do that in areas like, for example, jobs. We have a lot of information in jobs. You use your definitions of the industries, etc. You can develop indicators for the di different types of industry categories, like the enablers, uh, the producers, and users, etc. And then at the same time with the jobs, as I would say, there's different areas 
that didn't exist at all in 10 years ago compared to now. So 10 years ago, if you took the 10, top 10 jobs and compared them with, say, for argument's sake, the top 10 jobs and vacancies today, it's remarkably different. So, for, for example, cybersecurity, uh, website production, web publishing, certain types of software. I know software was around then, but there's lots of evolution of software. So it's these sort of indicators who could, could tell you where the growth and the rapid changes, but then you want some indicators to tell you where the steadily growing activities. So my real uh, addition here is really, we have the structural information and how can we produce even more timely information? I think jobs is a hook that you could actually have because we have a lot of information. Most countries have information on jobs and vacancies, which is much more timely than the latest supply news table and input output table. I agree with, there's a lot of issues. I mean, we can come on to the issues, but um, in terms of uh, asymmetries, how have you handled them, free data, Nadeem sort of mentioned. Uh, we still have the GDP bashing going on. And I know I've got a lot of learned colleagues in the UK. We have this organization called the Economic Statistics Center of Excellence, which does a lot of work with research and aligns and joins with the statistical office. However, the economists have very different views um, I agree with Nadim that we may have a consensus, but trust me, it's tough getting some of these economists who've got very different ideas of what should and shouldn't be included. Um, but we do need to bring them on board um, and then make sure we can meet their needs as well. I think I'll draw a line there for the moment. Okay, thanks a lot, Sanjeev. Oh, my last question is uh, to Dr. Sawada. Uh, what other aspects are related to uh, the digital economy that we can uh, consider as part of our project? Uh, yeah, um, I, I think I, I can um, mention one area. Uh, indeed, um, uh, this report has um, uh, going to have a special box on this, uh, which is the uh, issue of uh, uh, zero uh, price. Um, you know, Wikipedia, we used to purchase uh, uh, Encyclopedia to look for some um, um, uh, uh, technical term and uh, some explanation and you pay out of our pocket. But now uh, you can just simply uh, search over the uh, Google and um, uh, use uh, Wikipedia for free. So what's the, um, uh, um, uh, you know, the question is whether we can, we have been really capturing this uh, enormous uh, structural change in uh, accessibility to, uh, to the data, and the zero price to the data and zero price to the information. So uh, actually this report will have a box uh, uh, on this, uh, whether GDP capture free digital uh, media. Actually this issue is uh, related to a big kind of a debate in uh, policy arena and academia. Um, uh, after the um, uh, global financial crisis, uh, across the board, uh, regardless of developed economies or developing countries, we observe um, a slowing down of uh, productivity whether captured by TFP or labor productivity, uh, based on uh, uh, conventional national statistics, we see uh, across the board uh, slowing down of uh, uh, productivity. Uh, one group of people uh, like uh, uh, Larry Summers and uh, 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 Ben Bernanke said uh, this is um, um, uh, somewhat um, uh, you know, a major structure change uh, ongoing in global economy, um, uh, maybe attributable to um, uh, too much saving uh, in developed economy and also aging, massive uh, rapid aging and demographic change ongoing. So in spite of this um, uh, new innovation continuously made and uh, uh, available in a form of uh, uh, internet-based uh, app or uh, other uh, digital services, regardless of this, um, uh, in fact, um, uh, 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 frontier of digital digitalization nearly saturated. And um, uh, that's why we are seeing um, uh, so-called secular uh, st stagnation. And uh, this is a chronic problem. The other side of a group saying, uh, this is a measurement issue uh, because of a zero prices. Um, uh, notably, uh, MIT, Eric uh, Budi Jorfson uh, saying that uh, you know, second wave of a machine age is uh, already arrived and the continuous innovation technological progress so actually um, uh, conventional framework failed to capture this uh, zero price. So there is a discrepancy between uh, prices, uh, GDP, fear, and actual welfare of a people. 
you know, we uh, we enjoy a lot, uh, you know, services provided by Wikipedia or other zero price services. So this uh, discrepancy between uh, GDP and uh, um, uh, welfare is uh, widening because of the uh, lack of a proper framework. So uh, in this um, uh, report, we are trying to address uh, um, uh, this issue of uh, whether GDP capture free digital media in more systematic manner. In fact, the uh, conventional framework is not uh, really bad because uh, for example, uh, capturing um, uh, farmers, uh, cell production and household uh, production, et cetera, et cetera, uh, we had a similar problem. Uh, we don't have prices and maybe underestimated, so we uh, elaborated uh, uh, the way to impute uh, self production and the home production uh, service uh, uh, values. So, somewhat similar uh, manner, we can consider whether we, we really capture properly. And indeed, uh, even conventional um, uh, framework, uh, we capture uh, zero price uh, digital media services from uh, three angles. One is a uh, uh, user side. And uh, secondly, uh, from a platform, uh, you know, firm side uh, who generate the uh, services, and then uh, advertiser side because um, often uh, zero price is associated with uh, advertisement. So we, we can capture at least partially, um, uh, you know, advertisement value added. And um, uh, actually, our report tried to uh, say that um, uh, overall GDP levels are not necessarily. Uh, 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 you know, um, uh, substantially understated uh, by the amount of uh, free digital services. And indeed, uh, there is a possibility that uh, a mismeasurement alone does not explain the um, uh, across the board uh, productivity slowdown. So I think uh, this is the issue, how to properly capture digital um, uh, economy. And indeed, um, a traditional framework is not necessarily uh, bad. And I think uh, there is a huge room to elaborate on a traditional conventional framework to uh, systematically capture this uh, widening gap between uh, real GDP and pos possible uh, welfare measurement from a different uh, angle. So I think um, uh, uh, this is one issue I wanted to point out. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Sawada. Uh, so we have a number of questions. Uh, the first question is uh, very much relevant to ADB and its objectives. I will ask uh, Dr. Sawada to answer. So what's ADB's plan to help uh, poor countries uh, in digital economy? Uh, yes, thank you. Thank you very much uh, uh, for this question. And actually we are um, uh, standing in the middle of a uh, COVID-19 uh, pandemic still, and uh, vaccine rollover will um, uh, uh, progress, um, I hope, uh, uh, substantially in, even in the developing Asian economy. And I'm sitting in Manila still waiting for uh, uh, vaccination. Uh, indeed, uh, according to another report we produced, um, uh, uh, Asian Economic Integration Report, uh, we just released in February earlier this year. Um, um, according to this report, in the next five years, uh, digitalization will generate an enormous benefit uh, to um, uh, Asian economy, developing Asian economy if uh, uh, successful. And um, uh, according to our estimate, uh, successful um, uh, digitalization will generate 1.7 trillion US dollars benefit per year to developing member countries and also create a 65 million new jobs. So I think um, uh, this is very important uh, core element to support a robust uh, building uh, uh, better uh, or building better meaning uh, building uh, greener and building more inclusive. Uh, actually this um, uh, role of uh, digitalization uh, in um, uh, robust uh, COVID recovery is um, uh, stated uh, by uh, uh, President Masa Sakawa's uh, five priority areas uh, to achieve a prosperous, inclusive, resilient, sustainable Asian Pacific. And uh, one of the five pillars is uh, harnessing uh, digitalization, uh, acceleration of uh, transition to digital economy while closing a digital divide for ensuring uh, cyber security. So this is uh, uh, basically a um, uh, de facto official uh, pillar of uh, ADB support. Um, so this is a bigger uh, high level uh, statement and the ADB strategy. So in reality, what uh, ADB should do, um, considering uh, e-commerce, uh, you know, for people, uh, whether they can enjoy, uh, even, uh, even though a lockdown or a certain type of uh, uh, containment policy and uh, mobility restriction, where the uh, poor people sitting in a low income area in Manila, they can enjoy a digital um, a platform transaction e-commerce. 
I think there are a few uh, um, uh, necessary conditions uh, for the poor to gain out of uh, digitalization. First, this uh, poor person uh, should get access to internet. So accessible and affordable uh, ICT infrastructure is critical. Secondly, placing order and then uh, making a financial settlement. So I think uh, digital um, uh, uh, payment system, uh, that's also critical. And after placing order, payment, uh, uh, settling uh, uh, bills, uh, delivery is needed. So transport infrastructure uh, play a critical role. And also uh, for poor people to gain out of this um, uh, chain of uh, uh, service flows, uh, uh, he or she needs uh, uh, capacity to operate, uh, uh, you know, gadgets and uh, 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 tablets and uh, iPhone. So I think uh, um, uh, digital skills, uh, literacy training, capacity buildings are also uh, uh, critical. And then in order to enable and materialize all of this um, um, uh, ecosystem of a digital economy is. Uh, uh, indispensable. So setting a regulatory framework and uh, uh, rules and uh, uh, roles uh, for a proper uh, uh, business settlement, um, uh, government should set uh, properly. Uh, and um, uh, also uh, when it comes to the um, uh, uh, digital divide and uh, cyber security, government can also play a critical role. Then um, uh, COVID-19 recovery uh, domestic resource mobilization in a long term to sustain uh, debt, accumulated debt is uh, critical. So taxation mechanism is also uh, important. Um, and taxation, when it comes to the taxation, international co cooperation collaboration is uh, necessary. So a regional cooperation framework uh, is uh, indeed uh, uh, indispensable. So all these uh, component, ADB can help uh, ICT infrastructure, capacity building, um, um, uh, digital platform uh, uh, infrastructure, uh, financial inclusion type of uh, projects and uh, uh, transport projects, and also helping uh, gov governments building up uh, ecosystem and international co collaboration. So these are all um, um, uh, uh, areas ADB uh, already has been uh, playing a key role to support and also uh, ADB is uh, planning to do so. And the uh, final part, uh, international tax, Co cooperation last month during the uh, annual meeting of ADB, uh, we launched uh, uh, international half of uh, domestic resource mobilization and international tax uh, cooperation uh, for the uh, Asian Pacific region. So I think uh, all these respect ADB has been and will play a very important role. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, very, uh, Dr. Sawada, for a very comprehensive response. It certainly connected the research to the operations. Thank you. My next question would be, to Nadim because it's a measurement challenge. And uh, uh, I am sure Nadim will love to answer this question. Um, how do you measure the share of digital economy without uh, the share of digital economy in GDP without double counting with other sectors uh, such as agriculture and so on? That's, that's a very good question. I think that, I mean, this is why you have to be very careful about the uh the input output approaches to doing all of this. Now, of course, the conventional, the ONTF input output approach, when you're looking at the contribution that the value added embodied in final demand avoids um, that form of double counting. You don't get the double counting in the system. The double counting appears um, when you're looking at the inputs that are being used from other industries, and then you're adding them into the output. So there's an output dimension, but output in terms of gross output that can generate double, double counting. But, Look, I mean, I, I'm generally comfortable with double counting as long as people are aware of basically the, that it's there. I mean, so you don't want basically to say that this is the contribution of basically the set of industries to GDP, because that's not the case if you're double counting it. You can refer to it as the contribution to gross output, for example, that will be fine. But I think you have to be careful um, with the, the language that you use. So I'm, so I'm generally relaxed about you know, the, the, the materialization of double counting, because of course, you know, double counting to some extent is inherent in the way that we think about gross output as opposed to GDP. They're not the same concept. So I think that's, that's where the confusion often arises. If I, if, if I may, I just wanted to come back a little bit on some of the other points that were made very quickly. And I, you know, I think that the, uh, the point about this notion of GDP and welfare not being the same thing is critical in this discussion. You know, we've done a lot of work um, you know, over the years, looking at what's missing from GDP, and there's not an awful lot. Let's, I think that's perhaps the, the first, the first point. And when we think about free, 
there are also basically conceptual challenges that we have to also reflect on. There's lots of things that are currently non-market that are not in GDP, and they're not included for good reasons. And so when we think about the household services that we provide for ourselves, our cleaning services, our cooking services, they're not in GDP, and there's a process of production, but including them in GDP moves the concept of GDP away from something that's useful for macroeconomic policy making, for monetary policy. So we have to be very careful about what we wish for. You know, if we were choose, if we were to include, for example, within GDP, all of these welfare enhancing components, for example, free searching, um, then we end up in this situation where potentially what we will be saying is that, look, you know, an economy's GDP has increased because more people are using YouTube than ever before. And that, that wouldn't be very useful for macroeconomic policy making. And it certainly would be very useful when we think about aspects of inclusiveness, because of what we'll be doing is potentially shrinking income inequalities because, you know, you, and, and that will be perhaps artificial and not very good for policy making. I also want to talk a little bit about perhaps just the, the digital divide that you mentioned, um, Dr. Sawada, because of course this is really important, the digital divide. And the digital divide, I think, you know, also has this very strong place-based dimension. So when we think about Asia, you know, we also have to make sure that digital divide doesn't manifest itself as being increased when we think about the rural and the urban divide, but also the large economy, the, la the large firm and the small firm divide. We've done a lot of work in that within the OECD where we look at the place-based impact of the digital economy and that digital divide. And that's where I think there's an important element that needs to be fixed. And that's where policy focus um, should be made. In particular, thinking about the, the thousands and millions of small firms that you have in Asia, which are also struggling on that digital transition and struggling that digital journey. We've seen many of them, of course, embracing digitalization during the pandemic, but they need assistance. They need assistance in particular. I think you mentioned this too, Mr. Soeda, um, in terms of basically making sure they don't find themselves um, digitally vulnerable, you know, basically to hackers and all. So that, that I think is where an awful lot of the focus needs to go, improving the digital infrastructure so that everybody has access, but also improving digital skills in particular um, in SMEs. Last, last point, I think that I wanted to, to, to reinforce the message that's already been made. When we think about the productivity slowdown, it's not a measurement problem. You know, we've done lots of work on this and we've, and we've even had extreme views in terms of, you know, okay, let's assume that we had this price mismatch. Let's assume this was included. What would be the impact on productivity? We do not see the productivity conundrum or the productivity paradox solved by changing the way that we measure GDP. Even if we included all data, even if we changed our price concepts, we don't see a massive impact in terms of the contribution to GDP. And we don't see a massive impact in terms of basically its addition to productivity. So that's the final point I wanted to make. Thanks, Nadeem, for a very insightful response. Uh, the next question uh, is also conceptual. I will ask uh, Sanjeev to take that question. Uh, is the GFCF term uh, different from the fixed uh, capital consumption of the digital economy per period? Thanks, Joe. Um, very quick answer, yes. Um, obviously, when we are seeking to capitalize assets related to the digital activity, that will also then generate the need for life lengths, uh, how we depreciate to generate the consumption of fixed capital and then any capital services, because obviously you've got to have a, a production and asset to generate the capital services. So that's a quite a straightforward one. Uh, actually, whilst I'm on, I'll just piggyback a little bit on what Nadeem said. Uh, the GDP welfare discussion is huge. Uh, the need, to, the, the clamor to include consumer surplus is huge. I don't think we need to go down that direction, but we need to engage with dialogue with the economists and the 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 the, the arena out there where people are seeking these things. There's a lot of GDP bashing, um, and I agree with Nadim. There's less missing than what people think there's missing. Um, the double count is also misinterpreting. Uh, value added and output are two very different things. So there's a lot of this is in a way we need to do a bit more education. Uh, more understanding and explanation of what we're doing, what we're measuring and why. A um, couple of areas that haven't come up, I think when we link to digitalization and the way forward and the policy world is um, privacy and security. And it's becoming more and more important where you've got hacking, you have people with lots of their personal information held electronically, allowing for identity fraud, et cetera. Although this is not a statistical 
issue per se, but it is linked to digitalization and the policies that governments and bodies will implement. So it doesn't go without um, the need for data, but there's a lot of other activities that we need to be aware of. Um, and on productivity, I agree. I think when, for example, coal was uh, identified, electricity, steam, oil, these are massive commodities in terms of changing everybody's lives on a huge scale from the producers, enablers to users. So electricity before, electricity and after is very different. Now, in terms of the internet and the digitalization, the question is, is the productivity utility now at marginal? The gains are there, but they're marginal because people are expecting to see these wafting huge gains of productivity because the investment in digitalization in some way, shape or form, and they're not really materializing. So therefore it must be a measurement problem because obviously we're not measuring any of these things properly. Now, there may be issues about the free activity, but that's been around a long time. So I think there may well be an element of once we've exhausted it, any possible measurement issues, and we accept there will be some, but they're not going to be considerable, is our expectation of trend growth productivity need to change? Because the inventions of today have less impact on productivity than the inventions or the identifications of uh, assets and sources 100, 200, 300 years ago. So there is something that where we need to think about changing our expectation as well. Thanks. Okay, uh, thank you very much, uh, Sanjeev. I think we have only a couple of minutes left and uh, several questions. So what uh, our team will do is uh, gather all these questions and provide you uh, written answers. Uh, we know who uh, asked these questions and we'll be able to provide uh, written answers to all these questions in due course. Um, so that uh, brings uh, this seminar to an end. Uh, first of all, uh, thank you very much to uh, Clara for uh, presenting uh, our the results of our studies and our panelists for uh, their insights, comments, and also responses to the question. And uh, I would like to also uh, just give uh, additional information uh, and information about our forthcoming uh, seminar. Um, Mel, could you share the screen? Yeah, thank you. Okay, uh, so please join us again uh, in the next uh, Asia Impact Webinar entitled Disaster Resilience in Asia on 1st of July, uh, Thursday, and it'll start at 2 p.m. Manila time via Zoom. Uh, thank you all. Uh, stay safe. Thank you.